And Hello. welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Safe Haven Games. The the one and only Pixelbeard himself, creator of uh, co-creator of Freelancer Sky is over, over Tolandia. Hoping I got that pronounced right. The one and only Brian <laughs> Mosley. How are you doing tonight, man? Doing well, thank you. And yes, you did pronounce it correctly. So, good on you. Mm -hmm. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. Okay. With that, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? <clears throat> well, uh, my first introduction to role playing games uh, was actually in college. Uh, I'd kind of grown up in a household where um, they were not like, you know, seen as evil or anything, but just kind of looked down upon. My, you know, it was just not. A community my parents were involved in and so i was never really introduced to it my mm -hmm. friends never played them and I, I just had no exposure uh in college i found a game club and joined them and kind of got introduced very very roughly to dungeons and dragons um but i never really got into it because uh, uh with no background in it uh, and jumping into 3.5, um, I had, I was, it was in over my head <laughs> with the level of complexity and stuff, uh, mm -hmm. of the game at the time. And so I kind of just jumped out of it and, uh, it was, it wasn't until much later when I started, uh, when I got reintroduced with, uh, fifth, uh, D and D five E. And uh, I realized, oh, this can actually be quite accessible. And so played a couple games, uh, started a couple characters in that. And then um, really my, my now partner at the time, uh, just good friend from this uh, same college club, Jake Hampton, um, he started showing some of the designs that he had been making for various RPGs and always with very interesting, unique systems. Um, and that really got me interested in like, well, there's other ways to do an RPG. It's not just Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. Um, and so I started really like uh, diving into some, some more uh, indie RPGs and some smaller things. And, uh, yeah, it just, it kind of really took off that I really, I love the variety of different kinds of characters and backstories and, uh, the different systems and for character progression and stuff. Uh, so I started really just devouring all that. And when we eventually decided to, uh, go into business together and, uh, we did, were talking about, okay, well, what kind of game do we want to make as our first joint game? And we just immediately both turned to this one system that we had been uh, working on for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this, this needs to be our first thing. <laughs> this is, this is easily the, the, the game we put the most, uh, you know, love and care into. And we have, a very rich world established. Um, and yeah, so it was just kind of a slow evolution for me from absolutely zero exposure to being fully immersed in it. <laughs> yeah. It's especially now um, putting aside the fact that I have, I have to laugh at the fact that if you combine, if you combine the number of, um, Game, number of backed games and number of created ga games on your, on on Kickstarter for you, it ends up being <laughs> six six six. Oh. It's true. I I noticed that just yesterday, and I was like, ooh, I might need to just back something right now. <laughs> um, 
What are you talking about? I put I go with that as a situation where I, where I just say, Alexa, play Iron Maiden. <coughs> um, there you go. And yeah, technically speaking, this would be your this would be your first in, this would be your first introduction since the um, last few things that you've done have been mostly um, board and card games. Um, Correct. And to that to that end, what what can you tell me about your experience shif shifting from doing board and card card game development to doing RPG development? Well, uh, for the most part, I started. Uh, designing board games with uh a game called winds of fortune mm -hmm. um again just after college i kind of my wife and i were just living uh kind of in the same area and all of our friends were still you know kind of from college we're still living in the area and we would still have game nights it was just kind of a interesting like in between uh, the real world and college, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, creating little games, uh, mostly inspired by things like... Uh, skirmish games like Mordheim. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would create these things. They were horribly balanced, horrible games. But it was, it was always really fun to play. Uh, my wife loved throwing you know, 36 attacks at an orc because it felt good, not because it was balanced or fun, you know? Um, but, you know, we played these little games and one of them was this naval combat game. And I started thinking, God, I really want to actually produce this, but I have no idea where to go. I've not looked into this professionally at all. Um, and I kind of gave up on it. And it was actually not for years later until I realized um, I could basically make a miniature game a board game if instead of miniatures i use cards um and i created wins of fortune as a uh collectible card game mm -hmm. that used a board and actually maneuvering the uh cards around the board as miniatures essentially um and from there i started you know whatever game idea came into my head i just ran with it and developed it and i started you know kicks uh, i had the one successful kickstarter with winds of fortune um and started going to conventions and learning a lot more about the industry um i started really consuming a lot of uh podcasts and uh blogs about game design and uh really kind of went through a self-education course of Realizing that a lot of my preconceptions about design were wrong. Uh, <laughs> my ideas of what made a good board game were just wrong. Uh, realizing everything from manufacturing to distribution methods that I had been doing were wrong. Uh, and I really started pulling out of a lot of this uh, stuff. I, you know, I'd been self-publishing a couple... Uh, little party games and stuff like that, mostly in the, you know, the realm of, you know, a hundred copies uh, to bring to conventions to sell in person. Hmm. Um, but I became a member of uh, Gamma and I went to a lot of classes. I've learned a lot about uh, game manufacturing hmm. and what it, what it actually, you know, takes to make a profitable game and, uh, run a profitable company and uh, it's now my full-time job and I'm you know this is kind of a this game marks a a transition from kind of family or party games and go into more uh, I, I guess heavier game heavier gaming and uh, specifically for us uh, role-playing games uh right now yeah now that that brings me to the um to the origin of, of something like freelancer now for, first off where did the idea of doing a, of doing a game in this style this which if i'm not mistaken from the way it's described is a very um di is a very diesel punk <laughs> fantasy um approach yeah we've kind of been waffling between calling it diesel punk and calling it an industrial fantasy. 
because uh, it's not exactly like, you know, diesel powered stuff. Uh, it's actually um, refined dragon oil is used. Uh, the magic inside refined dragon oil is used to uh, smith magic runes, which can imbue power into a machine. And then based on that, like that, that was the thing that clicked for uh, the society in Talindia to really have launched their industrial revolution. And so they do have, uh, you know, gas powered and combustion engines and stuff. But um, it's like the the thing that kicked off technology for them is uh, the magic runes. And so it is a very magical world. But magic itself is not something to be like harnessed and wielded like a wizard mm -hmm. yet. Yet, <laughs> and that does bring me to one other thing. It was a very bold move in the, in this case to do this sort of <laughs> um, industrial revolution fantasy, but not but not have and not have any sort of magic users or its or its equivalent with it within it, because a lot of people have the <laughs> presumption that if you're doing some sort of fantasy setting there's going to be some form of ma some sort some form of um magic even if even if it's an extremely low magic setting there's usually some sort of assumption that some magic exists and right and that's not really the case here i mean there's the there's the runes as you said but even that's um stretching it well, so we have a couple things uh, because we definitely didn't want to exclude, you know, mage players. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do actually have right now uh, in the book, um, one of the many skill trees that you can uh, go down is the um, the rune staff tree. Mm -hmm. And so one of the pieces of equipment is a rune staff. And basically that is uh, we have an image of it. Uh, floating around on our page, uh, the half elf is wielding it. Um, but basically, it's it works similar to like a lacrosse net, uh, where uh, you actually it casts the rune and then uh, is able to kind of like bling and launch like either fireballs or lightning or whatever it needs to at enemies, mm -hmm. but it takes like cartridges or uh, dragon oil cartridges and charging. Um, so, you know, in a way it allows you to somewhat play a mundane wizard. Like you're still a spell slinger, but it's not like inherent in you. Um, one thing that we definitely are working on is uh, later in the timeline of Talindia, we will be introducing uh, i don't want to give away too much and you know my partner jake would probably kill me if uh i got the details wrong in it <laughs> he it, this is mostly his world that he's developed and i poured a lot into it we've put a lot of play testing into the mechanics but like he is 100 percent the lore master of this world so i really apologize if any of the details that i get i say are uh, incorrect um, but we are working on the addition of, um, actual mages in the game. They're going to be as our, our goal, everything is that everything kind of have everything that has a classic fantasy feel to it is a little bit turned on its head, right? We wanted elves to not be these, you know, elegant, immortal race of, Assholes. you know, flowy flowy goody two shoes they're bar they're kind of barbaric highlander elf um like they're they're beastly they are uh the uh, yeah the they have I, a, the a very um strong personalities and and uh they're just now they're not exactly what you'd expect of mm -hmm. elves like like I said, they um, the way you describe it, they're 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 probably going to be assholes, but they're probably not going to be asshole in the traditional elf manner. Um, there, there you go. <laughs> um, much in the same way that dwarves are assholes, but dwarves will be assholes to your face. 
I mean, at least they're, so right. at least they're honest about it. Um, yeah, I, yeah. And since you since you alluded to um, a more a more um, Highland like approach, so that would that would certainly explain why the um el why the elves in the um, artwork that I was able to see appear a lot to appear a lot taller, and would also explain the kilt, <laughs> but. That was that part was yeah, kind of obvious. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to the mechanics, you guys are using a D10 die pool where it's success based, where every um, every seven or higher is a, is a hit, and any um, ten, and any tens count as a hit with an ex with an extra die. And I'm guessing that effect is cumulative. Um, Correct. So if you were to have a check where you're only rolling, I think the minimum you could possibly roll is two. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're rolling two dice on a check, you could still get a success no matter how many uh, successes are required for a successful check. Yeah, uh, it, it's possible, though not likely, um, that anyone could succeed at anything. I would not trust the dice gods that much. <laughs> And nor should you, but we've had some very fun moments <laughs> in our hours and hours, uh, almost a year. Well, no, actually longer than a year. Uh, oh God. Wow. I've been playing this for a long time. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, I'm just saying that years of playing, years of playing different XCOM games over, over the course of my life has made me extremely paranoid about RNG. Right, you don't take that shot unless there's a 98% chance, and even then you're gonna miss. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I think I, I think I still ha I think I still have my my um straight jacket from the time I tried to marathon play the um long war mod. Why I okay. marathoned it, I have no idea. Maybe I am maybe I am that much of a masochist. <laughs> um, but. Something I'm something I'm curious about is given that given that um given that five E was kind of your was kind of your comeback intro and I'm sure you had to, I'm sure you've tooled around with uh, with other games in the intervening um, times. Mm -hmm. What prompted the idea of going with a D10 die pool? Well, um, honestly, that was something that uh, Jake had already played around with. Um, and so he came up with the system and, uh, I can't tell you exactly what prompted it other than he wanted the flexibility. Um, I know that he, he like the flexibility of the D10 is that it can be rolled as a percentage. It can be rolled, you know, th and the number of successes, it can be adjusted very easily and fluidly by a gm um the amount of dice rolled is something that you can very easily uh upgrade uh the the value of advantage or disadvantage um on a dice roll basically giving you a 10 percent increase or decrease in your probability it just it was a very smooth and uh natural set of numbers to work with mm -hmm. and um yeah it, uh, it seems to work well um now the now the system that immediately comes to mind whenever i think of a d10 dice pool is obviously the store obviously the storyteller system um the one used in world of darkness and its um sister brands over the years um okay what in that's in that system they do have they they do have their own take on bo on botches where where um a a equivalent to a critical failure is what is when you roll no successes and you rolled at least one one um do you have something similar to that or is that not or is that not something that you had put in the cards we don't exactly have something that's akin to critical failure. However, we do have um, your character's vices. Um, so instead of relying on critical failure based on your dice rolls, mm -hmm. um, the GM is able to actually uh, use plot points 
to trigger your character's particular vices. For example, uh, a character that is gun shy, which is something they would actually choose in their character creation. Um, the GM might take the opportunity to trigger someone's gun shyness, uh, making them always act last in a combat uh, scenario until they can kind of gather their, themselves. And the players can actually either spend heroic actions to negate that triggering uh, and kind of collect themselves immediately, or they can just take the hit and uh, all, kind of remain in character, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of bonuses for the players that use their vices on their own um, in just role-playing it. Yeah. Now... Given, given the given the fact that obviously for a lot of characters magic is not is not going to be a a high priority compared to uh, compared to other kinds of um, builds, especially get especially given the um, setting. Mm -hmm. I know we I know what I'm what I'm curious about are some of the are some of the means that players ha that players have to customize. When it comes to when it comes to abilities, when it comes to and when it comes to um, equipment, well, there are a lot of opportunities to customize. Um, so first of all, th oh my gosh, I'm trying to totally think. I mean, every single skill tree in the game has seven uh, skills that can be selected. You have to select the novice skill first. And then that unlocks all the um, the journeyman skills, and then there's a master mastery skill after you've learned every journeyman skill. Mm -hmm. But you can take as many different novice skills as you want, uh, as you know, assuming you pay the um, the renown for them. Uh, so you can really combine and build your own combinations of skills from different, you know. Uh, whether you're going in down the, um, you know, the, gosh, let's see, the acrobatics tree. Maybe you want to go down an acrobatics tree, make your character very agile, able to get up in difficult places. Maybe he's able to, you know, disengage with an enemy with no penalty um, or maybe even with an advantage to disengage. Mm -hmm. Uh there you know and then you want to combine that with another ability that is when you know from a weapon skill tree that is when you're equipped with a one-handed weapon you can attack you know and you uh you can perform an attack as you perform a disengage action so all of a sudden you start creating combinations based on your play style based on what your character is uh in a very freeform way but not so open that you know, you're overwhelmed with all your potential options, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, 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 well, I'm a little bit biased, but when I say, you know, it's the perfect combination of being open and free form without being uh, so open that you are just facing, you know, analysis paralysis the entire game. Yeah. Um, and then with equipment, there's you know a wide variety of you know one-handed two-handed weapons you know unarmed styles uh we you can be a wrestler you can be the guy who tries to you know a duelist uh um you know we got pistol and sword styles we have rifles mortars you could just be a cannoneer i mean you, you know uh or do you want to be a medic? Maybe avoid the combat route altogether and uh, specialize in support classes, whether it be leadership or, you know, being the medic. Um, so we really, really, really uh, worked on making it so that you don't have to specialize in any one thing. You can choose to be the, you know, jack of all trades if you want. Um or you can choose one or two key things to focus on, but there's never a reason why someone has to just like lock down in all of my points are going into melee combat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or 
I want to be a melee character, but if I do, I'm not going to be a very charismatic character. There's no point where one thing takes away from another. Um, you know, if you want to be, focus on something, just start building it up and you'll be able to do it. All right, that def that definitely makes sense. Um, and given given that, I'm, gu I'm guessing that when it comes to requirements for abilities within these skill trees it's the um the prerequisites are are fairly are fairly rooted in just spending re spending renown which i'm guessing is your equivalent to experience points and um and some and if it's a higher tier just having something in the lower tier but nothing nothing straight nothing straight linked uh, correct. I think that for a few, there might be some based on your actual skills themselves, uh, like your actual abilities, but even those can be upgraded by spending renown. So like if you chose to completely min max and get rid of, you know, intelligence for some reason, um, you're probably not going to be able to take educated as your ability. Um, but if you wanted to take the time over the course of the game to raise your intelligence to learn the educated ability. Able to spend that renown on to upgrade, it's just, you know, how much time and how many contracts it takes for you to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to. When it comes. When it comes to when it comes to um the idea of re of renown um now I can I can get I can get the idea of using that to in, to increase your to increase either abilities or um, skills but something else that I saw on the character sheet that I was curious about and how this would play a factor is the column for attempts yeah that is our primary form of character progression um you don't have to wait until after combat or after a contract to actually level up your character um you it's you know similar to elder scrolls you're gonna actually level up your uh your prowess by simply making melee attacks whether you hit or miss um it's gonna slowly gain uh, the number of, uh, you know, tallies in the number of attempts every time you perform a check of any kind. And when the number of attempts equals two times the next level of a skill, the skill goes up. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing this, I'm guessing this was a means to make, to make sure that people act, people use a variety of their skills instead of instead of relying on just who has the highest skill rating? Um, definitely that, but also um, it was just a way that we could encourage uh, encourage non-social characters to engage in social situations, right? In, mm -hmm. You know, tr have characters who maybe don't specialize in combat to still be willing to, you know swing their sword instead of run and hide you know um they can everyone can get better as they try as they play uh and you know it's just you're going to get better it just might be a rocky start for some of you <laughs> yeah and now when it comes now um Obviously, this isn't something that was delved into the demo version, but when it comes to when it comes to character creation, um, something I'm curious about yeah. is if is um is the method that you that you're going with is it a case where so where you're given a you're given a set of points at the start and just told to go nuts, or do you have a more measured approach? Um, kind of a, a so a little bit of both. Um. When you start, the first thing you're going to want to do is pick your species. Uh, you know, are you going to be human, elf, half-elf? You know, basically picking your background of your character. Um, and those will have some effect on, you know, what skills get a, 
uh, what abilities get a bonus, you know, during. Um, then you're going to go into actually uh, uh, determining your ability scores. Mm -hmm. And we actually have an entire video on our uh, Kickstarter right now that goes over, goes through the entirety of uh, character creation. But um, yeah, at that point, you'll be able to add levels to those ability scores. Uh, you can actually even take one point away from something to increase one point in something else. Um, but even then, uh, I believe the highest level something can get uh, can get to is four uh, at character creation. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit limited. You're not just told, you know, here, have this many points and, you know, absolutely powerhouse your strength, right? But at the same time, you uh, you have the, you know, you have the freedom to spend those points how you want. Um, and then you get to skills and everything starts at skill level one and you're given 10 points and said, go to town, but nothing can be higher than level three. So again, it's, you know, you're capped during character creation, but you're also told to go for it. <laughs> and I'm also curious if the, if the, you, if I'm um, in this, there's some there's some example spreads for people starting out so they could have an idea about what might be um, a good thing to focus on if they want to if they want to do certain archetypes. Okay, yeah. Um, so we have some pre-generated characters mm -hmm. for the demo game. Yeah, and those kind of do take the the role of showing you some build options right so i mean we don't want you to get overwhelmed with you know the idea if i want to play the healer the you know the medic where would i start with that well we have included a medic her name is ravamana she's the strong blood dragonkin mm -hmm. and um yeah she's she's there she's you know we have her character she already if you want to build a different one, you can take a look at her skills and abilities and kind of take that as a starting point, right? Um, so they kind of do work like archetypes, but if you also saw that she's, you know, a burly strong blood, you might want to look at that and go, that's not the route for me. I want to be more of a support and healer. And instead, give her a different set of weapons, give her different skill trees. Nothing is, none of those archetypes are set in stone. They're all ready for you to mess around with. All right. Now, when it comes, now, um, when it comes to when it comes to customizing equipment, because something I did something I did notice is that even even sim even the most simple of we of weapons have have some forms of um of customization with the combination of traits and runes. And yeah, what I'm curious what I'm curious about is. Is um what is how what this enta what this entails in terms of how how far you can go to customizing, say your um melee and ranged weapons. So melee weapons, it's pretty straight. Inscribe or have a. Who. Uh, pay uh, describe your work with the best quality rune is going to be very expensive. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this is a rune scribe. I went you can actually learn it yourself, and it's a huge boost for the entire party because you can uh, inscribe runes for your entire party 
for a fraction of the cost. Um, <laughs> so everyone wants a rune scribe on their team. That being said, uh, you know, let's say basic sword has spot for two runes. You can pay to have two runes added to it. They might do things like the rune of balance might make it to where you are. Um, your sword is more likely to hit, uh, you know, it's, it's more, more balanced. You have advantage or something, you know, the there's free freezing, there's fire, there's, and there's all kinds of different runes out there with different effects. Um, and that being said, there's also, uh, you know, some runes can only be put on melee weapons. Some can only be put on ranged weapons and ranged weapons actually tend to have some, uh, added benefit of runic uh ammunition so you could you know have runes on your gun making it more precise or uh pierce am or pierce armor more but then you could also you know have runic bullets that are expended they're very expensive and you they and it's gone uh but it also you know explodes on impact or bursts into flames and you know causes extra damage and whatnot mm -hmm. uh we also have uh weaponry like crossbows and whatnot with uh recoverable ammo that have really nice advantage of you can recover your runic ammunition right yeah um so there's a lot of stuff like that for weaponry and then we you know all the equipment has rune slots as well so if you wanted to get your armor and, you know, have a rune on it that makes it bust so that it might be able to even withstand something like bullets, um, <laughs> just not a bad idea in a world where, you know, there's bolt action rifles and cannon fire coming at you when, especially if you're a swordsman. Mm -hmm. And that is something I'm curious about when, it, when, with a system like this, you've got a you've got a, you've got a significant balancing act when it comes to when it comes to melee weapons and firearms and something and it's very it would be very very easy to lean a bit more on a bit more on firearms. Some so something right. I'm curious about is what methods do you have to make it so that firearms runes notwithstanding are not made too useful in comparison to melee weapons. Well, first of all, they're a little bit <laughs> they're a little more expensive. Um, second of all, the damage they deal is consistent whereas in melee weapons it has a lot of room to grow. Mhm. Mm um and honestly, in a lot of situations, uh ranged weapons are the better option but it can't be fought you cannot fire a uh ranged weapon into your same area barring specific abilities that might let you with like a pistol fire uh, i think we have a pistol um skill tree that allows you to actually use the pistol in melee as a melee weapon but firing it um so if an enemy can close the gap and get into range, melee combat with you, your gun is a club. Yeah. Like you can't fire it at him. I'm guessing. I'm guessing that when it comes to the firearm technology, um, the idea of automatic or semi-automatic um, weaponry hasn't it hasn't gotten there yet, or that kind of weaponry is ridiculously expensive. We're gonna go with ridiculously expensive. There are repeater rifles, um, but they are definitely not early level weapons. Um, that being said, even those weapons, um, if you're using cover properly, uh, and I mean, um, I highly recommend it. It's going to just straight up increase your defense, which is your, your ability to dodge and avoid damage. Um, there are, uh, there's a swords path that focuses on parrying and actually gives you the chance to parry bullets. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of options out there um, to counter guns, and guns have a couple key weaknesses, being slow to reload 
And also, um, well, as I mentioned, if someone's able to close the gap and get into melee combat with mm-hmm. you when you have a gun, uh, you're suddenly at a huge disadvantage. All right, I can, so, get, I can get that. Yeah. Um, speaking of swords, this is this is a test that I like to I like to put with certain games. Would it be possible for two for two um, characters who who um, say that say that they're both both the same species, both using um, a both using a saber as their as their main melee weapon? Mm-hmm. Would it be possible for the t- for their choice of talents to be di- to be different enough that they could have different play styles com- um, almost completely? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, almost every weapon type has multiple skill trees. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, while I might have a simple one-handed sword, I could go the duelist route. If I get a shield and a sword, I might be able to go one different route. If I get my sword and pistol, I could go a different route. If I just have my sword, I think there are like three or four different skill trees. And even then, if I went like a pickpocketing route, I might be able to play uh, or, you know, or a more social route. I might play, uh, you know, the almost Captain Jack Sparrow type character who's so busy talking while he duels the opponent Mm -hmm. that he just tricks him or, you know, gets him angry and looks for openings, uh, exploiting them emotionally before attacking them. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, there's lots of different variety uh, of play styles. Yeah. without having to be you know completely different uh differently equipped yeah um and it's it's good that you mentioned some a jack sparrow approach because i see a, i see a lot of um a lot of swash and buckle in this in this kind of in this kind of setting yeah yeah um and that does bring me to the to the concept of um freelancers now, given it's in the name, um, I mm-hmm. think it's I think it's fair to assume that the player characters will be will be um, freelancers. And, I'm, and um, what I wanted to ask about, and I realize this is a bit of a lore question, so I might be um, I might be putting you on the spot here. That's okay. But what but what exactly does being a does being a freelancer entail, and specifically what sort of responsibilities? do they have regarding the um, amount of leeway that they, that they have? Well, I can, I can actually answer that one really, really well. (laughs) Um, So being a freelancer, you're a knight of Talindia Mm -hmm. and the freelancers are kind of a, a military organization outside of the actual kingdom itself. Um, They are sworn to, uh, basically protect the people of Talindia first. They will obey the king. They're loyal to the kingdom. Uh, but, you know, there's all these different political factions within Talindia. There's the parliamentarians who actually kind of run the nation. There's the royalists who want to, you know, give power back to the royal family. Um, you have... Uh, well, you have a lot of different political factions, all with their own agendas, and each of these factions uh, give contracts to the players, and they are going to determine what kind of party they want to be based on what kind of contracts they want to accept. Mm-hmm. So usually a GM will approach the party with like two or three or even more contracts say this one's from the parliament over here wants you to investigate this city and you know maybe put down x you know corruption or x you know peasant riots yeah whereas you know over here you have the local garrison wants help with you know some theft or some hijacking of uh, you know various airships whereas you might get a contract from the the dragon slayers guild saying that, you know, there's a monster that's been terrorizing the Hills. So you have all these options from the get go and the players just decide what their priorities are. 
Uh, do we care more about the people that are, you know, starving to death over here or the people that are getting attacked by monsters over here? Well, I don't like the parliament, so I'm going to go over here and work with these people. And every single one of these um, contracts will also have uh, political ramifications, right? If I choose to only do jobs for parliament, parliament is going to gain influence in the world Um tremendously quickly and if they gain enough influence they might start overstepping their boundaries maybe asking you to do things that you guys are not comfortable with maybe acting more totalitarian um if a faction that doesn't have a lot of authority starts gaining authority and rivaling those that are in charge mm -hmm. you might be looking at a civil war um and so the players have to deal with uh, kind of realistic, semi-realistic uh, political consequences for their actions, while at the same time staying true to what they believe. You know, uh, you don't want to let the poor people die of disease if you can help it. On top of that, we've had you know had great success testing uh, um, contracts where if you ignore a contract for too long the the difficulty of that contract when you do take it will increase and you know that's all up for the gm to decide how that you know how they want to run that but um on the players to uh make those decisions together and wisely but also like the option is purely on them Which I can definitely get. I can definitely get behind that that appro that approach. Now, in the, in a more, well, for lack of a better term, comfortable end end of things. You know, something that um probably won't get you yelled at if we, if we, if <laughs> there's a botch. Um, I'm curious about the um resource known as heroic actions. Now. And I've talked about this in other interviews with other people, but in a lot of games, especially games outside of the D twenty based bubble, mm -hmm. you tend to have a you tend to have a mechanic that I refer to as an extra effort system. Um, mm -hmm. In Shadowrun, they have Edge. In Warhammer, they have um, Fortune. In um, Legend of the Five Rings, they have Void Points. You know, some sort of limited resource that you can use to apply a bit of a boost to your role, but you can't reliably use it right is heroic actions in that paradigm and if so how how does it work in your system so uh, it is similar so first of all it can be used uh, it can be used a wide variety of ways mm -hmm. uh first of all as i mentioned earlier it can be used to negate the gm triggering your uh character's uh vice right so you know maybe your character's restless and you guys haven't finished setting that you guys are pl have been planning for a while. And the GM says, you know what? This restless character can't help himself. He kind of like looks out the corner and the enemy has a chance to spot him. It's like, oh my gosh, that'd be so frustrating. Well, you can spend a heroic action to keep yourself in check, even though it's not necessarily within your character. You can You can argue. He knows the importance of this, you know this ambush he's not he's gonna hold he's gonna keep himself self-control right mm -hmm. um the other way uh, thing to use is you can use it to trigger your own virtue so you know you might be uh a natural leader and you can use uh heroic action to encourage all of your own men giving them all advantage to their own combat checks and to their own morale um or you know you can use it and maybe if maybe you're a um oh, i'm blanking on some of the some of the virtues but uh basically you could use it to increase you know or re-roll a dice roll or uh whatever but whatever your virtue allows you to do right um the other and the most common way to use heroic actions is if you are reduced to zero health you spend a heroic action and you immediately go back up to full health. But 
you roll on a uh, injury table and take a heroic injury uh, that will be in effect until you can go get medical attention. So maybe you'll get, you know, uh, you'll, you might get a leg wound or a chest wound, or uh, you might start bleeding or various other effects. Um, but it'll keep you alive. If at any point you end up with no heroic actions and reducing down to zero health, you're dead. Yeah. So it's a vi- it's a very valuable resource to keep in uh, keep a few points left over in. In that regard, it does remind me a bit of the um, of the fate points in the um, FFG 40k games, where burning fate could be the could be one of the things that actually actually keeps you from get from having a little bit of you over there, over there, over there, oh, and down here too. Right. Um. <laughs> And I'm I'm guessing that I'm guessing that that was meant to throw a bone because even as st- even with starting characters, the the thing that I noticed is um d- is the fact that damage it damage relative to health is ve- is very um <laughs> very not it's very high. unkind. Yeah, you're yeah <laughs> yeah. You've got pe- you've got pe- you've got people with um. With with health somewhere around the five point range, and wep and weapons are going to be taking a good a good chunk of that before you get before you get into any sort of um any sort of cage rolls with Lady Luck. Right. So that's definitely one of the things. Uh, that's another thing I was going to mention is that it actually uh, heroic actions help with the um the power balance of ranged weapons. Mm-hmm. Because you could get taken down to zero health in a single well-placed shot. If you're not using cover uh, to maximize your defense, if you don't have, uh, you know, a good amount of armor or something like that, you could get, you know, brought down to zero health in one shot easy. That being said, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to maximize, you know, taking cover taking a you know take cover action um a lot of those things will increase your defense so that most shots will miss you or you know graze you for one damage um there's ways to decrease the amount of damage done to you and if you do get hit you now just take an injury Mm. and you are able to just keep going yeah um Basically, unlike an NPC, you are a hero, and you should be able to keep going. So we have literal plot armor. Literal plot armor. There you go. <laughs> but and some and something else I did something else I did notice is when it comes to the de- when it comes to the uh, damage that weapons can do. You, of course, you have the. First off, there's the fact that damage isn't rolled. It's um pretty straight. It's pretty straightforward, unless I'm mistaken. Correct. Uh, it's not something that you you don't roll for random damage. Uh, you have an effect. It's you know either it's a set number with a set amount of armor penetration, or it's you know a number plus your strength mm-hmm. and or you know or de- dexterity based on the we- depending and on the weapon. When it comes, um, to... but it's not going to be. Yeah, it's not going to be um, widely different from what you see. It's not going to. No one's going to be like roll a d twelve. Oh, it's either between one and twelve. You know. Yeah. Um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the way armor works in some games, when when some I've seen I've seen two approaches to how to how to do it. One is it reduces the total amount of damage that you end up taking and the other is it um, makes you harder to hit. Period. Um mm-hmm. and the the flaw that can happen sometimes is that it trivializes the th- the um threat of small of smaller weapons. Mm-hmm. So so you have the question of what of why should why should I take a knife when I can take when I can when I should try and take the largest sword that I can or if I can't do that why am I why should I go in melee, and what I'm curious about is how is do you 
do you have you maneuvered the way armor works in in a way so that even somebody using a knife can can still be a threat? Yeah. So first of all, armor is great and all, but it's only ever going to reduce your damage down to a minimum of one. If you get hit, you're still hit. Um, secondly, most things can penetrate armor. Uh, like almost everything has some degree of armor penetration. Um, so unless you are a very heavily armored character or emphasizing in robust armor, uh, you're not going to be, you know, completely ignoring armor. Um, the other thing is, uh, like you did, you, you definitely, uh, touched on, uh, the situation with, you know, your agility actually in the pre-built characters for the demo game, mm -hmm. which are available for download on the, uh, Kickstarter page, um, there are two characters uh, that I'd like to kind of just highlight real quick. So Katarina mm -hmm. is our hare. She is agility four. And that makes her pretty much the dodgiest thing uh, starting character that you could have. Um, and she, that means that an enemy is going to have to roll four or more successes to do any damage to her. And see, you know, again, on a D10, that's a seven or higher. And seeing as most early enemies are going to be rolling five dice, mm -hmm. they're going to be needing very lucky hits, uh, rolls to be able to hit her. But then if they do hit her, she's in trouble. The other uh, route is to go Ravamana, who has, she's burly. She's only defense one. She, so you need one success to hit her. Congratulations. You're probably going to hit her. Um, but she has a ton of health. And she has natural armor. She has her shield. She has, you know, I mean, so all of a sudden you're looking at a very tanky character that, uh, you know, you could still get through that armor. But there's such a wide variety of ways to um, be dodgy or armored that yeah if you want to be a knife wielding character you know and go with low level low power weapons you're just as likely to encounter enemies that uh, emphasize one or the other method of avoiding damage um, so I mean yeah, you might encounter a band of heavily armored characters that you're not really doing a lot of damage to, but around the next corner, you might be, you know, just dealing with some dodgy characters who are right up your alley and be able to hit them and do just as much damage, just enough damage, right? Mm -hmm. And now, when it now, um, give now, given all of that. Now you get you guys are get are getting are getting fairly close to the to the uh, goal. Um, at yeah. the time of this recording, you guys are just two. You guys are just um, one point four. Oh, no, one point four k away from it. Um, yeah. Now, allow me to knock on wood for a moment. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? At well, least for the di we're at least for the digital version. For the digital version, well, for the digital version, we are working on uh, working with Roll Twenty, mm -hmm. and we're working on creating all of the um, digital assets needed to create a um, a collection in the marketplace for Roll Twenty, and uh, we're going to start distributing a uh, digital edition. Uh, through Roll20 so that players can play there and it's also uh, fairly easy to um, to keep track of the downloads, it, it all being in one place. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, uh, for the physical editions, it's a lot easier to track when that'll be done and ready to go. 
Um, we are just working on some final uh, formatting and plugging in some of the artwork. The game is fully tested. Uh, we are needing to add a you know a tiny bit of testing now that we have been adding uh, new playable species to the game. <laughs> but uh, so we'll test those new species in in relation you know as NPCs and as player characters. Um, but for the most part, all of the information is in the book right now. It's just a matter of formatting and paying for artwork and uh, getting it all plugged in. Then it's off to the printers and shipping. And, you know, that can take three to six months. So we've just kind of planned for the worst case scenario there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've said that an estimated uh, delivery date of November of 2021. Uh, I don't anticipate it taking that long <laughs> but we want to definitely play it safe with a worst case scenario instead of you know under deliver which i can i can certainly get i can certainly get behind that particular con that particular uh, concept um how many pages would you say you're shooting for that depends on what funding level we can get to. Honestly, uh, we have right now the rule book is a when we when we reach the ten thousand dollar goal, the rule book is a two hundred and fifty page soft cover rule book, uh, not including if you uh, back at the RuneSmith level, uh, we're gonna have those copies. Actually, we're gonna have the covers taken off meticulously, and uh, uh, you'll be getting that book turned into a handcrafted leather bound. Uh, goal mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, 1750 goal uh, all the rule book w the rule book will be a hardcover book also have been up to 400 pages so it'll be a 400 page hardcover rule book um, with tons of lore and uh, that doesn't include, I think there's like, you know, something like six different uh, um, contracts that will already like as digital downloads that will be included and developed. Um, there will be all the pre-generated characters and the STL files. Um, there's a lot of really cool monsters coming um, as uh, 3D printable files and stuff. So... And including, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have uh, two people have pledged to the Dragon Slayer level, meaning that no matter what, we're going to be getting at least uh, every backer is going to be getting at least two digital monster files. We just don't know what they're going to be yet based on what the, the people who pledged uh, that level want to help design. I'll definitely, I'll definitely be look, I'll definitely be looking forward to to that, because um, <laughs> I am I am fully in favor of people designing insane things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. As as one should as one should when they're given a blank canvas, well, semi blank. Obviously, there's <laughs> limits to this kind of thing. I mean, it's um, correct, correct. You're gonna be working with us to, you know, we'll we'll have to kind of rain you rain you in a little bit but we definitely don't want to kill your joy either we definitely want to see what what the other creatives in the industry can uh in, in this world can give us yeah um yeah but with all with all that said i do want to sincerely <laughs> thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity <laughs> that takes place here time zones notwithstanding <laughs> no that's awesome uh, it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as I often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged alright well thank you very much and uh, yeah I appreciate it and if uh, anyone listening has not yet gone and checked out the uh, the kickstarter I highly recommend it mm -hmm. um and of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. 
And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>